The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg It was many years ago. Hadleyburg was the most honest and upright town in all the region round about. It had kept that reputation unsmirched through three generations and was prouder of it than any other of its possessions. It was so proud of it and so anxious to ensure its perpetuation that it began to teach the principles of honest dealing to its babies in the cradle and made the like teachings the staple of their culture thenceforward through all the years devoted to their education. Also, throughout the formative years, temptations were kept out of the way of the young people so that their honesty could have every chance to harden and solidify and become a part of the very bone. The neighboring towns were jealous of this honorable supremacy and affected to sneer at Hadleyburg's pride in it and call it vanity. But all the same, they were obliged to acknowledge that Hadleyburg was in reality an incorruptible town, and if pressed, they would also acknowledge that the mere fact that a young man hailed from Hadleyburg was all the recommendation he needed when he went forth from his natal town to seek for responsible employment. But at last, in the drift of time, Hadleyburg had the ill luck to offend a passing stranger, possibly without knowing it, certainly without caring, for Hadleyburg was sufficient unto itself and cared not a rap for strangers or their opinions. Still, it would have been well to make an exception in this one's case, for he was a bitter man and revengeful. All through his wanderings during a whole year he kept his injury in mind and gave all his leisure moments to trying to invent a compensating satisfaction for it. He contrived many plans, and all of them were good, but none of them quite sweeping enough. The poorest of them would hurt a great many individuals, but what he wanted was a plan which would comprehend the entire town and not let so much as one person escape unhurt. At last he had a fortunate idea, and when it fell into his brain, it lit up his whole head with an evil joy. He began to form a plan at once, saying to himself, That is the thing to do. I will corrupt the town. Six months later he went to Hadleyburg and arrived in a buggy at the house of the old cashier of the bank, about ten o'clock at night. He got a sack out of the buggy, shouldered it, and staggered with it through the cottage yard and knocked at the door. A woman's voice said, Come in, and he entered, and set a sack behind the stove in the parlor, saying politely to the old lady who sat reading the Missionary Herald by the lamp, Pray keep your seat, madam, I will not disturb you. There, now, it's pretty well concealed. One would hardly know it was there. Can I see your husband a moment, madam? No, he's gone to Brixton and might not return before morning. Very well, madam, it's no matter. I merely wanted to leave that sack in his care to be delivered to the rightful owner when he shall be found. I am a stranger. He does not know me. I am merely passing through the town tonight to discharge a matter which has long been in my mind. My errand is now completed, and I go pleased and a little proud, and you will never see me again. There is a paper attached to the sack which will explain everything. Good night, madam. The old lady was afraid of the mysterious stranger and was glad to see him go. But her curiosity was roused, and she went straight to the sack and brought away the paper. It began as follows. To be published or the right man sought out by private inquiry, either will answer. This sack contains gold coin weighing 160 pounds, 4 ounces. Mercy on us, and the door not locked. Mrs. Richard flew to it in all a tremble and locked it, then pulled down the window shades and stood frightened, worried, and wondering if there was anything she could do towards making herself and the money more safe. She listened a while for burglars, then surrendered to curiosity and went back to the lamp and finished reading the paper. 
I am a foreigner, and I am presently going back to my own country to remain there permanently. I am grateful to America for what I have received at her hands during my long stay under her flag, and to one of her citizens, a citizen of Hadleyburg. I am especially grateful for the great kindness done me a year or two ago. Two great kindnesses, in fact, I will explain. I was a gambler. I say I was. I was a ruined gambler. I arrived in this village at night, hungry and without a penny. I asked for help in the dark. I was ashamed to beg in the light. I begged of the right man. He gave me twenty dollars. That is to say, he gave me life as I considered it. He also gave me a fortune. For out of that money I have made myself rich at the gaming table. And finally, a remark which he made to me has remained with me to this day and has at last conquered me, and in conquering has saved the remnant of my morals. I shall gamble no more. Now I have no idea who that man was, but I want him found and I want him to have this money, to give away, throw away, or keep as he pleases. It is merely my way of testifying my gratitude to him. If I could stay, I would find him myself, but no matter, he will be found. This is an honest town, an incorruptible town, and I know I can trust it without fear. This man can be identified by the remark which he made to me. I feel persuaded that he will remember it, and now my plan is this. If you prefer to conduct the inquiry privately, do so. Tell the contents of this present writing to anyone who is likely to be the right man, and if he shall answer, I am the man, the remark I made was so and so, apply the test to wit. Open the sack, and in it you will find a sealed envelope containing that remark. If the remark mentioned by the candidate tallies with it, give him the money and ask no further questions, for he is certainly the right man. But if you shall prefer a public inquiry, then publish this present writing in the local paper with these instructions added, to wit. Thirty days from now let the candidate appear at the town hall at eight in the evening, Friday, and hand his remark in a sealed envelope to the Reverend Mr. Burgess, if he will be kind enough to act. And let Mr. Burgess there and then destroy the seals of the sack, open it, and see if the remark is correct. If correct, let the money be delivered with my sincere gratitude to my benefactor thus identified. Mrs. Richards sat down gently, quivering with excitement, and was soon lost in thinkings after this pattern. What a strange thing it is, and what a fortune for that kind man who set his bread afloat upon the waters. If it had only been my husband that did it, for we are so poor, so old and poor. Then with a sigh, but it was not my Edward. No, it was not he that gave that stranger twenty dollars. It is a pity, too. I see it now. Then with a shudder, but it's gambler's money, the wages of sin. We couldn't take it. We couldn't touch it. I don't like to be near it. It seems a defilement. She moved to a further chair. I wish Edward would come and take it to the bank. A burglar might come at any moment. It is dreadful to be here all alone with it. At eleven, Mr. Richards arrived, and while his wife was saying, I am so glad you've come, he was saying, I am so tired, tired clear out. It is dreadful to be poor and have to make these dismal journeys at my time of life. Always at the grind, grind, grind on a salary. Another man's slave, and he's sitting at home in his slippers, rich and comfortable. I am so sorry for you, Edward. You know that. But be comforted. We have our livelihood. We have our good name. Yes, Mary, and that is everything. Don't mind my talk. It's just a moment's irritation. and doesn't mean anything. Kiss me. There, it's all gone now, and I'm not complaining any more. What have you been getting? What's in the sack? Then his wife told him the great secret. It dazed him a moment. Then he said, 
It weighs a hundred and sixty pounds. Why, Mary, it's forty thousand dollars. Think of it, a whole fortune. Not ten men in this village are worth that much. Give me the paper. He skimmed through it and said, Isn't it an adventure? Why, it's a romance. It's like the impossible things one reads about in books and never sees in life. He was well stirred up now, cheerful, even gleeful. He tapped his old wife on the cheek and said humorously, Why, we're rich, Mary, rich. All we've got to do is bury the money and burn the papers. If Gambler ever comes to inquire, we'll merely look coldly upon him and say, What is this nonsense you're talking? We've never heard of you and your sack of gold before. And then he would look foolish. And... In the meantime, while you're running out on one of your jokes, the money is here and it is fast getting along towards burglar time. True. Very well. What shall we do? Make the inquiry private? No, not that. It would spoil the romance. The public method is better. Think what a noise it will make. And it will make all the other towns jealous. For no stranger would trust such a thing to any town but Hadleyburg, and they know it. It's a great card for us. I must get to the printing office now, or shall be too late. But stop, stop, don't leave me here with it, Edward. But he was gone. For only a little while, however, not far from his own house, he met the editor, proprietor of the paper, and gave him the document and said, Here's a good thing for you, Cox. Put it in. It may be too late, Mr. Richards, but we'll see. At home again, he and his wife sat down to talk the charming mystery over. They were in no condition to sleep. The first question was, Who could the citizen have been who gave the stranger the twenty dollars? It seemed a simple one. Both answered in the same breath, Barclay Goodson. Yes, said Richard, he could have done it. It would have, would have been like him, but there's not another in the town. Everybody will grant that, Edward, grant it privately anyway. For six months now, the village has been its own proper self once more, honest, narrow, self-righteous, and stingy. It is what we always called it to the day of his death, said it right out publicly, too. Yes, and he was hated for it. Oh, well, of course, but he didn't care. I, I reckon he was the best hated man among us, except the Reverend Burgess. Well, Burgess deserves it. He will never get another congregation here. Mean as the town is, it knows how to estimate him. Edward, doesn't it seem odd that the stranger should appoint Burgess to deliver the money? Well, yes, it does. That That is, that is, why so much that ising? Would you select him? Mary, maybe that stranger knows him better than this village does. Much that would help, Burgess. The husband seemed perplexed for an answer. The wife kept a steady eye upon him and waited. Finally, Richard said, with the hesitancy of one who was making a statement which was likely to encounter doubt, Mary, Burgess is not a bad man. His wife was certainly surprised. Nonsense, she exclaimed. He is not a bad man, I know. The whole of his unpopularity has its foundation in that one thing, that thing that made so much noise. That one thing, indeed, as if that one thing wasn't enough all by itself. Plenty, plenty, only he wasn't guilty of it. How you talk, not guilty of it. Everybody knows he was guilty. Mary, I give you my word, he was innocent. I can't believe it, and I don't. How do you know? It is a confession. I'm ashamed, but I will make it. I was the only man who knew he was innocent. I could have saved him, and, and well, you know how the town was wrought up. I hadn't the pluck to do it. It would have turned everybody against me. I felt mean, ever so mean, but I didn't dare. I hadn't the manliness to face that. Mary looked troubled and for a while was silent. Then she said stammeringly, 
I, I, I don't think you would have done for you too. One mustn't, or, or public opinion, one has to be so careful. So, it was a difficult road and she got mired. But after a little, she got started again. It was a great pity, but why he couldn't afford it, Edward? We couldn't indeed. Oh, I wouldn't have had you do it for anything. It would have lost us the goodwill of so many people. Mary, and then, and then, what troubles me now is what he thinks of us, Edward. He? He doesn't suspect that I could have saved him. Oh, exclaimed the wife in a tone of relief, I am glad of that. As long as he doesn't know that you could have saved him, he, 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 will might, he makes a great deal better. Why, I might have known he didn't know, because he's always trying to be friendly with us, as little encouragement as we give him. More than once people have twitted me with it. There's the Wilsons, and the Wilcoxes, and the Harknesses. They take a mean pleasure in your saying, Your friend, Burgess, because they know it pesters me. I wish he wouldn't persist in liking us so. I can't think why he keeps it up. I can explain it. It's another confession. When the thing was new and hot, and the town made it a plane to ride him on a rail, my conscience hurt me so that I couldn't stand it, and I went privately and gave him notice, and he got out of town and stayed out till it was safe to come back. Edward, if the town had found out, don't. It scares me yet to think of it. I repented of it the minute it was done, and I was even afraid to tell you lest your face might betray it to somebody. I didn't sleep any that night for worrying. But after a few days I saw that no one was going to suspect me, and after that I got a feeling glad I did it. And I feel glad yet, Mary, glad through and through. So do I now, for it would have been a dreadful way to treat him. Yes, I'm glad, for really you did owe him that, you know. But, Edward, suppose it should come out some day. It won't. Why? Because everybody thinks it was Goodson. Of course they would, certainly. And, of course, he didn't care. They persuaded poor old Salisbury to go and charge it on him, and he went blustering over there and did it. Goodson looked him over like he was going to hunt for a place for him he could despise the most. Then he says, So you are the committee of inquiry, are you? Salisbury said that was about what he was. Hmm. Do they require particulars, or do you reckon a kind of general answer will do? If they require particulars, I will come back, Mr. Goodson. I'll take the general answer first. Very well, then. Tell them to go to hell. I reckon that's general enough. And I'll give you some advice, Salisbury. When you come back for the particulars, fetch a basket to carry what is left of yourself home in. Just like Goodson. It's got all the marks. He had only one vanity. He thought he could give better advice than any other person. It settled the business, Mary, and saved us. The subject was dropped. Bless you, I'm not doubting that. Then they took up the gold sack mystery again with strong interest. Soon the conversation began to suffer breaks, interruptions caused by absorbed thinkings. The breaks grew more and more frequent. At last Richards lost himself wholly in thought. He sat long, gazing vacantly at the floor, and by and by he began to punctuate his thoughts with little nervous movements of his hands that seemed to indicate vexation. Meantime, his wife, too, had relapsed in, into a thoughtful silence, and her movements were beginning to show a troubled discomfort. Finally, Richards got up and strode aimlessly about the room, plowing his hands through his hair, much as a somnambulist might do who was having a bad dream. Then he seemed to arrive at a definite purpose, and without a word he put on his hat and passed quickly out of the house. His wife sat brooding with a drawn face, and he did not seem to be aware that she was alone. Now and then she murmured, Lead us not into 
but 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 we are so poor, so poor. Lead us not into oh, uh, who would have hurt be hurt by? No one would ever know. Lead us. The voice died out in mumblings. After a little, she glanced up and muttered in a half frightened way, half glad way. He is gone. But oh dear, he may be too late, too late. Maybe not, maybe there's still time. She rose and stood thinking, nervously clasping and unclasping her hands. A slight shudder shaked her frame, and she said out in the dry throat, God forgive me, it's awful to think such things. But, but Lord, how we are made, how strangely we are made. She turned the light low and slipped stealthily over and knelt down by the sack and felt of its ridgy sides with her hands and fondled them lovingly. And there was a gloating light in her poor old eyes. She fell into fits of absence and came half out of them at times to wonder if we had only waited, oh, if we had only waited a little and not been in such a hurry. Meantime, Cox had gone home from his office and told his wife all about the strange thing that had happened, and they had talked it over eagerly and guessed that the late Goodson was the only man in town who could have helped a suffering stranger with so noble a sum as twenty dollars. Then there was a pause, and the two became thoughtful and silent, and by and by nervous and fidgety. At last the wife said, as if to herself, Nobody knows this secret but the Richardses, and us, nobody. The husband came out of his thinkings with a slight start and gazed wistfully at his wife, whose face was becoming very pale. Then he hesitantly rose and glanced furtively at his hat, then at his wife, a sort of mute inquiry. Mrs. Cox swallowed once or twice with her hand at her throat, and then in place of speech she nodded her head. In a moment she was alone and mumbling to herself, and now Richards and Cox were hurrying through the deserted streets from opposite directions. They met, panting, at the foot of the printing office stairs, and by the night light there they read each other's face. Cox whispered, Nobody knows about this but us. The whispered answer was, Not a soul, on honor, not a soul. If it isn't too late to... The men were starting upstairs. At this moment they were overtaken by a boy, and Cox asked, Is that you, Johnny? Yes, sir. You needn't ship the early mail, nor any mail. Wait till I tell you. It's already gone, sir. Gone? It had the sound of unspeakable disappointment in it. Yes, sir. Timetable for Brixton and all the towns about. Changed today, sir. Had to get the papers in twenty minutes early. I had to rush. If I'd been two minutes later... The men turned and walked slowly away, not waiting to hear the rest. Neither of them spoke during ten minutes. Then Cox said in a vexed tone, What possessed you to be in such a hurry? I can't make out. The answer was humble enough. I see it now, but somehow I never thought, you know, until it was too late. But the next time, next time be hanged, it won't come in a thousand years. Then the friends separated without a good night and dragged themselves home with a gait of mortally stricken men. At their homes, their wives sprang up with an eager, Well? Then saw the answer with their eyes and sank down sorrowing without waiting for it to come in words. In both houses, a discussion followed of a heated sort, a new thing. There had been discussions before, but not heated ones, not ungentle ones. The discussions tonight were sort of seeming plagiarisms of each other. Mrs. Richards said, If you'd only waited, Edward, if you'd only stopped to think, but no, you must run straight to the printing office and spread it all over the world. It said, Publish it. That is nothing. It also said do it privately if you liked. There now, is that true or not? Why, yes, yes, it's true. 
but when I thought what a stir it would make, what a compliment it was to Hadleyburg, that a stranger should trust it so. Oh, certainly, I know all that. But if you'd only stopped to think, you would have seen that you couldn't find the right man, because he's in the grave, and he hasn't a chick nor child nor relation behind him. And as long as the money went to somebody, that awfully needed money, and nobody would be hurt by it, and, and she broke down crying. Her husband tried to think of some comforting thing to say, and presently came out with this. But after all, Mary, it must be for the best. It must be. We know that. We must remember that it was so ordered. Ordered? Oh, everything's ordered. When a person has to find a way out, when he has been so stupid, just the same it was ordered, that the money should come to us in a special way, and it was you that must take it on yourself to go meddling with the designs of providence. And who gave you the right? It was wicked. That is what it was, just blasphemous presumptuous. And no more becoming to a weak and humble professor of... But, Mary, you know how we've been trained all our long lives, like the whole village, till it is absolutely second nature to us to stop not a single moment to think when there's an honest thing to be done. Oh, I know it, I know it. It's been one everlasting training and training and training in honesty, honesty shielded from the very cradle against every possible temptation. And so it's artificial honesty, and as weak as water when temptation comes, as we have seen this night. God knows I never had a shade nor shadow of any doubt of my petrified and indestructible honesty until now. And now under the very first big and real temptation, I, Edward, it's my belief that this town's honesty is as rotten as mine is, as rotten as yours. It is a mean town, a hard, stingy town, and hasn't a virtue in the world but this honesty it's so celebrated for and so conceited about. So help me, I do believe that it ever comes the day that its honesty falls under a great temptation. Its grand reputation will go to ruins like a house of cards. There now, I've made confession and I feel better. I'm a humbug, and I've been one all my life without knowing it. Let no man call me honest again. I will not have it. I, well, Mary, I feel a good deal as you do. I certainly do. It seems strange, too, so strange. I never could have believed it, never. A long silence followed. Both were sunk in thought. At last the wife looked up and said, I know what you're thinking, Edward. Richard had the embarrassed look of a person who is caught. I'm ashamed to confess it, Mary, but it's no matter, Edward. I was thinking the same question myself. I hope so. State it. You were thinking if a body could only guess what the remark was that Goodson made to the stranger. It's perfectly true. I feel guilty and ashamed, and you? I'm past it. Let us make a pallet here. We've got to stand watch till the bank vault opens in the morning and admits the sack. Oh dear, oh dear, if we hadn't made the mistake. The pallet was made, and Mary said, The open sesame, what could it have been? I do wonder what that remark could have been. But come, we will get to bed now, and sleep? No think, yes think. By this time the Coxes, too, had completed their spat and their re reconciliation, and were turning in to think, to think and toss and fret, and worry over what the remark could possibly have been which Goodman made to the stranded derelict. That golden remark, that remark worth forty thousand dollars cash. The reason that the village telegraph op office was open later than usual that night was this. The foreman of Cox's paper was the local representative of the Associated Press. One might say it's honorary representative, for it wasn't four times a year that he could furnish thirty words that could be accepted, but this time it was different. 
His dispatch stating what he had caught got an instant answer. Send the whole thing, all the details, 1,200 words. A colossal order. The foreman filled the bill, and he was the proudest man in the state. By breakfast time the next morning, the name of Hadley Berg, the incorruptible, was on every lip in America, from Montreal to the Gulf, from the glaciers of Alaska to the orange groves of Florida, and millions and millions of people were discussing the stranger and his money sack and wondering if the right man would be found and hoping some more news about the matter would come soon, right away.